Okay, this is David Zeller, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It is Tuesday, May 2nd, 2023. It's great to be back with Professor Paul Asimo. Paul, once again, thank you for having me in your office. You're welcome. All right, so today we're going to pick up. You've made the decision to come to Caltech. Let me start with a, a road not taken question. You explained last time you were going to come here. The plan was to work in media rights. Then you saw what mission politics was like. You wanted to be more involved in field work. Did you ever circle back to meteorite research or is that truly something that got frozen in time at that decision point? I'm doing a lot of it now. Ah. So there was a 20 year hiatus uh, before I got interested again in meteorites and the route was circuitous. Um, my original interest in meteorites was the petrology, the when small asteroids partially melt and separate into cores and mantles and even crusts. That's an igneous petrology process that happens under conditions different from melting on planets like the Earth, lower gravity, different chemical conditions. Um, so that was my original interest. Then I went entirely into terrestrial igneous petrology and how rocks melt on Earth and what happens for graduate school and during my postdoc. But then when I came back to join the faculty, I started working with Tom Ahrens and getting interested in shock waves. And one of the other things you see in meteorites is they are very often strongly shocked because asteroids are always crashing into each other. And in fact, if we have a piece that's small enough to arrive on the Earth without causing a catastrophe, it must have been broken apart from a larger body at some point. So essentially all meteorites have suffered some kind of collision. So yeah, I came into meteorites through a different pathway of um, what they record in terms of shock events and my ability in the laboratory to simulate those shock events and learn something therefore about meteorites. At the same time as I started thinking more broadly about um, global geochemistry and the composition of the Earth and how we put together our estimate of planetary scale chemistry without grinding up the whole planet and measuring it, meteorites are where all that evidence comes from because they are pieces of planets surviving from the early solar system or planetesimals um, and they haven't been through as much complex processing over billions of years as terrestrial rocks. So yes, I did come back to work on meteorites, not in graduate school, but eventually. And I've also come back to work somewhat on planets. Um, my, um, through collaborations or through the interests of my students, um, I've become involved in work on Mars. And um, th the original planetary science that I did as an undergraduate concerned uh, impact craters on Venus. And now I've at least dedicated a week to, or two weeks to a KISS uh, study project on a potential mission to Venus in the fairly far future because it's a really a blue sky concept that we were talking about. But this might be the next big JPL mission to go to Venus. Conceivably. Yeah. Um, there but beyond your time scale. Well, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> That's I, an optimistic I, answer. If, if, if this concept moves ahead, and I'm not sure that it will, um, it might be ready to launch about the time that I retire. Oh, okay. Um, it's not really what we're talking about now, but the problem with Venus is two problems. The surface environment is very inhospitable, not only to life, but to technology. It's 450 degrees C, 90 bars of CO2 pressure. It's very acidic. Uh, the Soviet Union actually landed several landers on Venus that operated for about 30 to 45 minutes before everything was fried. Mm -hmm. um, there are only certain measurements that you can make in 30 to 45 minutes. It's not a lot of time. Um, on the other side, sample return from Venus is really hard. We haven't even managed sample return from Mars, which is a much smaller body with much lower gravity, and you can get off the surface of Mars with a much smaller rocket. Right? So getting something back from Venus, um, maybe that would be a great thing to do one day, but nobody's really talking about how to do it. So the intermediate um, option to study rocks from the surface of Venus without bringing them back to Earth and without trying to do it on the surface of Venus is to do it on a balloon in the upper Venus atmosphere. So 
about 50 kilometers up, the conditions in the Venus atmosphere are rather Earth-like. It's about 300 Kelvin and about one bar pressure. And we know how to build technology that works at those conditions. So the idea is, can we conceive of a mission where we get a long-lived aerial laboratory suspended from a balloon or maybe a glider or something that hangs out in the middle of Venus atmosphere while we drop quick sampling landers to the surface to grab something and come back up, rendezvous with the aerial lab and do the analyses there. Take a bunch of engineers from JPL and a bunch of scientists from Caltech and elsewhere and let them think about sure. how that would work, if it would work, why it would why it's worth doing for a week. That's what this Keck Institute's study project oh, wow. thing was about. Well, now that we have a helicopter flying around Mars, it's like nothing is too off the wall, I suppose. Why yeah. not? <laughs> so, um, anyway, th so I haven't actually published anything about Venus since my senior thesis as an undergraduate, but I'm still willing to think about it as an interesting place cool. to go. Cool. Just a point of clarification. So, as you explained previously, your unpleasant surprise for the pervasiveness of mission politics that steered you away from the meteorite research as a graduate student. Did well, you steered me away from mission-based planetary science research, um, which meteorite studies are not. Meteorite studies, you if you can get a sample, you work on it in your own lab, very much the way you do with terrestrial rocks. So it wasn't really the politics that drove me away from meteorites. It was just the particular problems that I start happened to start working on. Oh, I see. Then. Got got it. Got it. But the you always wanted to do field work going outside with your dad that was always so in some sense geology was a very natural pivot because obviously you knew how much field work would be involved in geology it was um, I'm not sure I realized it at the time um, that I had been raised to um, be preconditioned to love this kind of work and want to do it but I was as I, I realize that now looking back as an undergraduate, we've already talked about you know the considerations why you chose Caltech. Did geological planetary science l at Caltech loom large for you as an undergraduate at Harvard? Would you have come across the name of like a Bob Sharp, for example? No. Um, no, it was entirely the the doing of John Wood, my undergraduate thesis advisor, to introduce me to the place to point out its history and how um, suitable it would be for me and the kind of work and the I wanted to do in the kind of way that I wanted to do it. Um, I mean, even when I came out here the summer before my senior year um, to go to JPL for Magellan Venus orbit insertion, mm -hmm. um, I don't think at that point I quite fully appreciated the connection between JPL and Caltech. So when, you know, when I was much later chairman of freshman admissions and um, I came to, you know, discussions about Caltech's uh, publicity problem <laughs> and how do we, you know, make ourselves uh, visible, certainly I understand that because to me, even growing up not very far away right. uh, and even becoming a scientist, it, I was still invisible until it wasn't. Yeah. All right, so you arrive, what's the plan? Is it immediately that you're going to tackle this Stolper-Stevenson problem in tandem? That's the plan? Yeah, okay, so just for background, the way the PhD program works here is pretty unusual, pretty distinctive. We don't admit students to be the student of a particular advisor. Mm -hmm. That is the American model for graduate school, mm -hmm. is advisor, student, match. The money comes from the advisor. You don't admit a student unless the advisor has money. It's preordained at admission time. We don't do that. We believe very strongly that students are admitted by an option, or in my case, by the division, because I ended up changing options. And we insist that first-year students do two different projects with two different advisors on two different subjects for at least a year, even if they have a master's degree. The Old timers, when I started, would always point out that once upon a time it was seven different projects or something like that to prepare for your oral exam, and the fact that it was only two felt like <laughs> it had come <laughs> down a long way <laughs> since uh, the old days. Um, but 
the one of my projects I already knew because it had been pitched to me when I was shopping for graduate schools and I was interested in it and I knew it was a good project. So that was this experimental attempt to characterize melt migration uh, with Zolper and Stevenson. And then like most of our incoming students, I searched around for a second project mm -hmm. for a few months before settling on one. And the second project was jointly advised by Lee Silver and Hugh Taylor. Um, looking at a distinctive and interesting rock formation that outcrops many places around Southern California um, with several different names depending on where you find it. In the outcrop west of Palmdale it's called the Polona Schist. It outcrops underneath a major structure, a fault, that at that location is called the Polona Thrust. Um, and this unit seems to be underneath everything in Southern California although it only outcrops places where there's been enough uplift to bring it to the surface, which are several places along the major regional faults. Um, and the Polona schist is characterized by what we call an inverted metamorphic gradient. The preserved temperatures get hotter as you go up. Usually they get hotter as you go down. In the Polona schist they get hotter as you go up until you get to the Polona thrust fault. So that's interesting and we'd like to know why. And one of the ways we can infer the temperatures of at which rocks reacted with water and the amount of water that might have migrated through them is looking at oxygen isotope ratios. This is a field of geochemistry that was pioneered here mm -hmm. by Sam Epstein and then by Hugh Taylor. Mm -hmm. When I was here, Hugh was still active at the height of his powers and so I um, wanted to learn that kind of research. Um, both the field work of going out and sampling in a systematic way to get the right kind of samples as a function of distance below the fault and the structural geology of being able to reconstruct how far below the fault they were. So Lee Silver was an excellent regional geologist. He knew the area. He also invited Perry Elig, who was a professor at Cal State LA, who knew the area, to come out to the field with us once to introduce it. Uh, and then also to bring the samples back to the lab, separate the quartz grains and the garnets from them and working with Hugh Taylor and his student Greg Hulk um, to um, extract the oxygen and working with Sam um, to analyze the oxygen isotopes and put together a story about what we could learn about the rocks. What you so brought back, you brought back to Silver's lab? Um, Taylor's lab to separate the quartz grains and um, fluorinate them. The way we analyze oxygen isotopes, you start with silicate rocks, the oxygen is tied to silicon atoms, it's in a solid. We want to do mass spectrometry on it, we have to get it into a gaseous state. So uh, we react it with fluorine gas, which is very reactive, um, or sometimes with bromine pentafluoride. That breaks down the silicate bonds and liberates the oxygen. And then you react the oxygen with hot graphite to make it into CO2 and you actually then analyze CO2 gas where you've hopefully done it carefully enough that all the oxygen atoms came from the quartz grains and you haven't fractionated them by the processing so it, you'd need a vacuum line with furnaces where you can load a few milligrams of your rock let in fluorine gas let it react for a while extract the gas with the uh, cryogenic cold finger and then react it with the hot graphite and then freeze it down into another cold finger as CO2 or you can then take it to the mass spectrometer. So Hugh Taylor had the vacuum lines up in the penthouse on the roof of North Mud where if there were an accident with the fluorine it would only affect that one room and not the whole building. Mm -hmm. um, that turned out to be important in the um, Sierra Madre earthquake when that fluorine tank fell over and burst its regulator and flooded the roof with fluorine. Fortunately, it wasn't raining that day, uh. so the fluorine gas just dispersed instead of turning into hydrofluoric acid on the roof. Ooh, yeah. Um, but this is one of the reasons that the safety office here, correctly, is very um, strict about keeping your gas tanks chains, gas cylinders chained top and bottom, mm -hmm. because they will fall over <laughs> in mm -hmm. an earthquake. Anyway, Taylor had the fluorination lab, and then Sam Epstein had the mass spectrometer that we actually used to measure the um, isotope ratios in the CO2 gas. So doing that project involved working with three of the uh, 
great senior faculty at the time, Lee for the field work, Hugh for the processing of the rocks and interpretation of the oxygen isotopes, and Sam for the actual measurement of the isotope ratios. Yeah, what, what great exposure for first year graduate students. Mm -hmm. What did you discover about yourself from each of those aspects of the research? Um, interesting. So, it doing the field work with Lee certainly contributed to what I already knew that I liked doing field work, that I enjoyed being out there, and that I enjoyed learning from Lee. Um, I also took a field a full um, GE one hundred and twenty one advanced field geology course with Lee. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I learned that. Um, just because your geology professor is much older than you, you should not necessarily offer to walk up the hill and drive the Jeep down to pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> that situation was solved when somebody else came along with a Jeep and drove us both up the hill. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, working with Hugh and extremely hazardous chemicals like fluorine and with Greg um, Hulk, I learned the importance of careful, reproducible, systematic, standard operating procedures in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. um, I hadn't really done lab work before then. Um, and if you want good data, and if you want to be able to keep doing this kind of work and not get shut down, you have to be careful and systematic and do things right every time and so that's really where I learned geochemical lab procedure for the first time and when I asked Sam if I could run the samples on his mass spectrometer his reaction was are you careful and I wasn't really sure how to respond to that question how do I know if I am careful <laughs> um, I said well I think so <laughs> and um, that also was a very delicate instrument. This is this was an old mass spectrometer, kind of from the first generation of instruments that the geochemists here built themselves, doing all their own glass blowing and all their own electronics. Um, it was just about that time that commercial um, manufacturers started making mass spectrometers and selling them and putting them all in a box so you couldn't see all the guts. And um, Sam was never convinced that um, you could buy a mass spectrometer that was better than one you could build yourself. Mm -hmm. The world has totally gone that way now. Mm -hmm. Nobody mm -hmm. builds their own mass spectrometers. If you want a workhorse instrument, you buy one off the shelf. And if you want to develop something new, you work with a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. um, if you, at some point, interview John Eiler, you will learn about the process of designing a new mass spectrometer and then working with a vendor to build it. Okay. Um, but Sam's was home built, and so, like most home built instruments, it was easy to break. And you had to operate it with some caution. Um, I'm just going to shut the door. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will also say um, Sam Epstein had a special place in his heart for the Jewish graduate students. Mm -hmm and um, welcomed me very warmly as soon as I got here. Um, and I had this kind of grandfatherly um, way of watching over the students. So I certainly um, I didn't work that closely with him, but he was aware of my work. And he was one of the people who helped me feel welcome here, for sure. Did you feel firmly embedded on the experimental side at this point already? That that was already going to be where you would yeah. focus? That was my intent. Um, a few years later, I moved back into, or moved into computational yeah. geology. But at that point, yeah. certainly my intent was to focus on this experiment and that the experiment would be my thesis. And the analytical project with the fieldwork component was a second project because you had to have two projects. Um, that was definitely my assumption at that point. And this happens in parallel with the Stolper Stevenson pro um, problem. You're doing all of this all at once. Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah, this is what our first year of graduate school is like. Yeah. You are doing two research projects that are hopefully totally unrelated to each other. You're also taking classes um, and going to seminars and um, doing all the learning, ideally, that you need to, within a couple of years, be ready to do your thesis, right? And so you've taken all the classes you need for the background knowledge and skills. You've worked with your potential advisor for at least a year. You've taken your oral exam to show that you understand what the project is and why it's a good project and what you're going to do with it next. And then you do it. So yeah, first the first year of graduate school is busy. A lot to do, a lot to figure out. And one of the nice things about having two projects that are very different in style, like an experimental project and a field-based project, or an experimental project and a computational project, is the work habits involved in doing coding or versus the work habits involved in operating a laboratory are very different and complementary. And when the laboratory is stuck, instead of just sitting there and twiddling your thumbs, you can write some code. Or when the program is executing, if you're doing some big calculation job, instead of sitting there and twiddling your thumbs, you can go and do something in the lab. But um, Let's discuss the, the findings of both projects. So we'll start with Stolper Stevenson. What, what were some of the conclusions from that project? Um, there were none because we didn't finish it ah. at some level. Um, one of the problems with experiments is they have their own schedule. You have to work the hours that the instrument may need you to work in order to do the project. And that turned out to be incompatible with parenting. <laughs> <laughs> so I had this apparatus. I built it all up from scratch. I did a lot of test experiments on analog materials, on salt water solutions instead of rock magma solutions at room temperature, which are much easier. <clears throat> or of water and inert glass beads and things like that. And then just when I was about to do the real experiment, um, my first son was born. Mm. And I like literally turned the furnace off when my wife called and didn't get back to it for months. And then talking about work habits and what you can do as a young father, the computational work was much easier. And I could see that it was definitely going somewhere. Uh -huh. The experiment I th was probably going somewhere, but it was hard to work on it at that point and strategically not as obvious that it would lead to an influential thesis, so I let it go. Eventually somebody else did it, actually, um, a group at Woods Hole um, or Brown or MIT or all of them um, did a very similar experiment eventually. About ten years later, which I've discovered is the statute of limitations on a good idea, if you don't write your own paper in 10 years, someone else will write it for you. Mm -hmm. um, Was it worth someone else picking it up? You know, that paper hasn't, I would say, been all that influential. Um, the quantity that we were trying to determine fundamentally is called permeability. It's the ratio between the pressure gradient and the flow velocity of liquid in a porous medium. There are theories for how the permeability should depend on the porosity, on the volume fraction that is liquid versus solid in the porous medium. Depends on the geometry, and the geometry in the magmatic case is very complicated, so you can't really do the problem analytically. Um, so we express the permeability as a power law function of the porosity, and the exponent might be anywhere between one and five and a half. It should be two for planar cracks and three for um, cylindrical tubes. Somebody calculated five and a half for the actual geometry. There was one experiment that had been done that almost measured this quantity and got an exponent of one, which is very surprising. So it's kind of wide open. Even though that experiment has now been published, people still, when they're doing the calculations, typically run both the exponent of two and the exponent of three because they say we still don't know. So maybe the problem has not actually been solved. Mm. So that was what I was trying to do, was measure that exponent um, and settle the issue. So um, I learned a lot about um, experimental design and um, 
experimental technique that has proven useful to me over my whole career doing other kinds of experiments. Just the facility with high pressure plumbing, the facility with measuring high temperatures, the facility with um, data um, acquisition and capture, and a number of skills that I learned in the process of putting together this apparatus from scratch. The actual experiment never went anywhere. And that's okay. Sounds like your thesis went in a better direction anyway. It did. But what I was going to say is it is nice to be able to have a few false starts and to be able to work on projects that don't actually reach an endpoint and to be able to work on projects for a very long time before they do reach an endpoint. That is a luxury that not everybody has um, because you know, graduate school is only so long and a postdoc is only so long and an assistant professor has to get tenure in so many years. For most people, for the first third of their career, they feel like everything has to yield a payoff really fast. Mm -hmm. And some projects will yield a payoff really fast and some won't. So it is a luxury to be able to work on those um, and get away with it, right? And not have it drag your career down. So I feel fortunate to have been able to start lots of things and see where they go, pick which ones to finish, and still produce enough output that um, my talent has been recognized and my position is secure. And now with tenure, I have all the time in the world to cogitate about things for a very long time. And picking which, which projects to, f to finish, that's really a skill to learn to figure out how to pick the winners. Yeah. Right. And you know, we kind of have this model of how it's supposed to work, that you have an idea, you write a proposal, if the idea seems promising, the proposal gets funded, and then you do what you propose to do, and then you publish it. It doesn't always work that way, mm -hmm. and it's nice when it doesn't work that way, right? Um, frequently, by the time an idea is mature enough to write a good proposal, it's nearly done. <laughs> 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 um, and that's the importance of seed money and you know things like the centers at Caltech and various other internal sources of funding that we have like the income from the GPS chairs leadership gift allows him to fund discovery projects ideas that are not mature enough to compete for external funding but maybe one day mm -hmm. that's one of Caltech's critical advantages is we have enough money and enough patience to nucleate ideas that seem crazy and that wouldn't be competitive um, with most funding agencies um, and get them going until they are competitive. And there's a lot of, I think, a lot of places where you just can't do that because there isn't enough seed money sloshing around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at some level, that was my experiment in graduate school is we never wrote a proposal to fund it. Um, Stevenson and Stolper just had enough money sloshing around mm -hmm. to set me up and see where it went. Didn't go anywhere, but <laughs> um, it's it's part of the kinds of thing that you can do at Caltech yeah. that you can't do a lot of other places, is take those risks. Now the field work experiment, was the major research question there about why the temperature rises as you go up? Was that the, the basic thing you were after? That is part of it. The other part of it is which way is fluid flowing through the formation? Is it going upwards towards the fault or downwards from the fault? Um, ultimately, one of the very confusing things about that fault is nobody really agreed on which way it moved. And that's important because if it's a thrust fault, then all the rest of Southern California came from out in the Pacific and slid on top of this um, schist unit of ocean shallow uh, oceanic like continental slope sediments whereas if it's a normal fault then all the rest of North America is sliding off back towards the sea and so you'd like to know whether it's a thrust fault or a normal fault mm -hmm. and part of that story is were fluids coming down the fault and spreading out into the rocks around them or were they coming up towards the fault and um, draining to the surface along the fault so being able to 
trace the fluid flow direction is one of the things, in addition to the temperature gradient, that we would hope to get out of the oxygen isotope studies. Um, the um, result of that study that was most clear were the quartz veins. So when the rock cracks and it's saturated with fluid, the fluid will precipitate quartz in the cracks and make quartz veins. And those gave very clear and systematic oxygen isotope results, getting lighter towards the fault, which indicates increasing temperature towards the fault. Um, was the result we were looking for, and was consistent with flow upwards through the formation towards the fault, which in my view was most consistent with it being a thrust fault that was mostly bringing um, rocks in towards the North American mainland. Some years later, at another place in, in the Rand Mountains, um, working with Jason Salibi, a student named Alan Chapman did a very nice thesis showing that actually the reason it was ambiguous is that fault first moved as a thrust fault with rocks going on the top inland towards North America, and then later it slid back the other way. So it was both. Um, so th yeah, that was the, um, the main result there. I should say, in addition to working with Lee and Hugh and Sam on that project, we had a visiting professor, or possibly a Fairchild scholar, um, from Dartmouth named Paige Chamberlain, who came and taught a metamorphic petrology class that I took. And he had what was at that time a very unique capability to fluorinate minerals and measure their oxygen isotope signatures using a laser. So in situ spots, rather than taking the whole mineral and putting it in a, a bomb and reacting it with fluorine where you lose the spatial context. What does that mean, losing the spatial context? Well, if, if I take minerals, gr if I grind up the rock, take little pieces of the minerals, toss them in a reaction vessel, and react them in bulk, I can't look, for example, at the relation, the differences between the core and the rim of a given uh -huh. mineral grain, because uh -huh. that's all been homogenized. Uh -huh. If I make a polished section, and I come in with my laser, would make a small spot, and work my way in towards the center of the grain, then I do have that spatial context. So at Dartmouth, um, Chamberlain had a a laser fluorination set up to do just that. A few years later, everybody had those. Hugh built one here and towards the end of his career. Um, so I actually went and spent a week at Dartmouth analyzing the garnets, which are pretty large crystals, um, which can preserve zoning patterns, gradients in oxygen isotope ratios as they grow, um, which would be complementary to what we could learn from the quartz grains, which give just an instantaneous picture. So that was another fun part of that project. Um, more analytical skills that I learned and more ways to think about data and crystal growth and diffusion. Did Lee give you sort of a pl platonic ideal of what a great field geologist is? Yeah. Um, not just Lee. I had the opportunity to work with a number of what I consider to be great field geologists um, while I was here. Um, so every graduate student in geology needs to take three advanced field classes from three different instructors. And we have enough field geologists that we can keep a circulation of different instructors coming through so the students can actually satisfy that requirement. So I did advanced field geology classes with Jason Salibi in the fall of my first year, with Carrie C. in the winter of my first year, and with Lee in the spring of my first year. Um, and they were all great and they were all informative and they're all very different styles in the field. I also importantly had the opportunity to go on two or three uh, short field trips with Bob Sharp. Um, when I got here, Bob Sharp had just turned 80 and everybody said, you need to take Bob Sharp's field classes right now because who knows how long he'll keep doing it. He kept doing it for another six or seven years. <laughs> um, but the Bob Sharp trips weren't really so much about field skills as um, seeing the landscape and becoming familiar with it and um, just uh, exploring. And that's still in those classes, the 136 classes they're called. It's a class that is just a field trip. Each student gives about a 15-minute presentation about some feature you're going to encounter on the outcrop. 
that style of class has survived. Joe Kirschwink took it over and has been doing it for years and years. Um, also, our spring break trip to Hawaii, which Bob Sharp started, is run in a similar style. Uh, and it's just a really important part of our division culture. It's a way to bring students that are not necessarily geology majors um, out into the field to get a taste of what we do. Um, so I think Joe Kirschwink's 136 trips lately have been running like 50 people. Um, take all the division vehicles and go. So Bob was still doing that himself when I started and I did several of those trips with him. Um, yeah, so from from all of these Yeah, like sort of a composite sketch of yeah. what makes for a great field geologist. Um, an appreciation <laughs> for the um, complexity of nature and yet your ability to organize all the evidence available to you to tell a story that sees through the complexity, mm -hmm. right? And an understanding that you can never really um, describe natural settings completely and thoroughly. You always have to choose the viewpoint that leads to a coherent story. And there's always rough edges, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and apart from you know the appreciation of, of being outdoors and the importance of the problems that we study for society and resources and so on, this is one of the things that makes the difference between, in my view, between geologists and a number of other areas of science is that um, we're not trying to find complete analytical solutions that are provable and perfect. Um, we are trying to find um, enough coherence to make a model that has some predictive power and narrates what happened at some level. And then in this, our catalog language about why you might want to be a geologist in the Caltech catalog hints at this kind of thing, that you, you need to appreciate complexity and incompleteness and difficult data sets. If you want the answer, you can go and be a mathematician or a physicist. Um, and so, yeah, all of these professors understood and communicated that kind of um, sense of what you're trying to do when you grapple with a region. You can't tell the whole story. So you tell the story that you can tell, um, that you can defend, that you can support. And you, <laughs> from Lee, the most important lesson that I think I learned is being systematic about your collecting. If you are picking up rocks and bringing them back, as soon as you pick it up, you have lost some context. Mm -hmm. It is no longer attached to the ground in the place that it came from. Mm -hmm. And that is important information about that rock. So you record where you got the sample. You record as much as you can about how you sampled it and what it looked like before you sampled it. And you give it a unique number. And you never reuse that number for your entire career. That's it. And I keep working with geologists who send me samples whose numbers are like one, two, three, meaning on that particular project or on that particular day, it was the first, second, third sample they picked up. And after I've worked with these people for enough years, they've sent me 10 different samples that are all called number one. <laughs> and I keep trying to tell them, this is not okay, right? Your, every sample you collect for your entire life has to have a unique identifier or you will, get, or you will mess up. So for you, the numbers just keep getting bigger. No, I, I have a code that is diagnostic of when I was there and where I was and then the order in which I picked it up. Uh -huh. So it takes more characters, but it prevents you from making dumb mistakes. Um, so 
Lee collected a lot of rocks over the course of his career. And he analyzed a lot of them, and he didn't publish a lot of that data, and it's still sitting down there in the sub-basement. And now that he's gone, a number of his students and postdocs are coming back to say, can we publish this data that Lee and I gathered and Lee never published? And um, the fact that it never got published was a big problem, but it's easy for us to find which sample is which mm -hmm. and extract that data. And even though Lee is gone, the information is still there and we can still use it. So this is one of my obsessions <laughs> in geology is uh, curating a collection properly. Um, and in fact, after I graduated and went to Lamont Doherty as a postdoc where they are much more um, connected with ocean going expeditions mm -hmm. um, and I was invited to go on an expedition to the Lao Basin back arc in the Western Pacific, I just kind of naturally took upon myself the task of naming the samples, organizing the collection, making sure that everything was traceable to which dredge it came from, and, and just that was a skill I felt I understood and could do and wouldn't make mistakes. Um, from Kerry C., who is a somewhat different kind of geologist, he was studying neotectonics, the record of earthquakes and faults older than the seismographic record. This is what we call paleo seismology. Paleo seismology or neotectonics. Mm -hmm. Same science, yeah. right? Too old for instrumented earthquakes and too young to look at kind of um, bedrock contacts between different sorts of rocks. Mm -hmm. Looking at soil and alluvial fans and unconsolidated sediments and things, you know, say, 100 to 10,000 years old. Um, the um, bedrock geologists who are studying the consolidated rocks tend to refer to everything on top as overburden. Kerry would joke that beneath the rocks that he was studying there was underburden. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, another thing I learned from Kerry is that the job of the most enthusiastic student in the field class, the one who's always walking right behind the professor, is to make sure the professor doesn't step on any rattlesnakes. Ah. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, and Lee um, took us to the same place that he took the Apollo astronauts and made sure that we knew it. Mm -hmm. And made sure that we knew that Although these guys weren't geologists, they were careful observers and they could collect information and faithfully report it and be systematic about it. And that um, if we, with all our geological training, couldn't do as good a job as the astronauts, then we weren't trying hard enough. Mm. <laughs> um, and I should say, you know, I took field camp as an undergraduate, um, and I did these three advanced field classes, um, and I did this research cruise while I was a postdoc. But then I didn't do any other, in my career, field-based research for about 20 years. Mm. I did all laboratory and computational research. And I kind of forgot how much I like field research. I still ran field trips for my classes for teaching, but um, just kind of introductory sort of geotourism style field classes where you don't really engage with a region and try to solve unsolved problems. So it wasn't until actually um, 2018 that I mounted my own field-based research oh, project. Wow. Um, in Baffin Island in Arctic Canada, which is just, you know, gorgeous, exotic, faraway place. And then I was sitting there, you know, on a rock saying, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is why I'm in this business. And also, I know what to do uh -huh. when I'm here. Uh -huh. I know how to grapple with the region, where to go for samples, how to collect the samples in a way that's not destroying information. And 
the skills that I picked up in, in as an undergraduate and in graduate school all came back. The skill you just mentioned, where to go, so the skill of scouting, right? Mm -hmm. How do you know? What did you learn from your mentors about where is interesting and what a preliminary trip might look like to identify an interesting place before making a big field trip out of it? Right. You start with what information is available from prior, often reconnaissance level mapping that may have been done there. Um, if you can get air photos, you get air photos. Nowadays, if you can get satellite photos, mm -hmm. you get satellite photos. Mm -hmm. um, you read the literature, which leads you to hopefully understand that an area either has not been studied in detail or has been studied in detail by two different groups that have led to two different stories that need to be reconciled. Um, so you do your homework before you go to know why it's an interesting place to go to and what the questions are that you have in mind when you get there. If you're just doing reconnaissance level work, the point is just get there, see what you think you see, write it down and move on, and somebody eventually will come back and clean it up, which is very useful, but it's a different mode. And depending on how far out you go, most things have been studied at least at reconnaissance mm -hmm. level now. Um, and then when you get there, you start with a broad view of the area in question and ideally you develop the instinct of looking around at things from a distance and saying that's potentially an interesting target, that's potentially an interesting target. Um, and then you work your way down to the small scale of individual outcrops and individual hand samples that seem most promising for the problem at hand. So. If you're doing geochemistry on the rocks, so you're bringing back the samples in order to grind them up and measure their composition or make a section and look at it microscopically, often what you really are most concerned with is fresh rocks, rocks that haven't been weathered or altered. So you need to find bedrock outcrops, and most places, most of the ground is covered by plants, and even where there aren't plants, most places are covered by soil, and where the soil is worn away or eroded and you get bedrock exposures, most of it is weathered. This is especially true in the tropics. So um, last summer I did some field work in Cameroon, tropical Africa, and this was especially true that almost everything was vegetated or soil covered or weathered. And most of the skill and most of the time was just finding fresh outcrops mm -hmm. that had a chance of giving us information about what those rocks were like before they got close to the surface. It's a good reason to work in deserts if you can. There's not that much vegetation cover. Weathering is relatively slow um, because there's relatively little rainfall and it's easier to find fresh rocks and um, see all the relations instead of having to infer the relations from isolated outcrops. But you can't always work in the desert. Um, sometimes you have to go where you have to go. Um, In the case of the Baffin Island project, one of the primary reasons to go to these basalts on Baffin Island is they have the world's most exotic ratios of helium isotopes, which is thought to be a signature of rocks that are coming from the lower mantle. Helium isotopes can be messed up by cosmic ray exposure. Actually cosmic ray generated helium-3 is a thing you can measure if you're specifically interested in cosmic ray exposure and are trying to do surface dating. We were trying to measure the helium that was in the rocks before they were exposed to the surface, so our priority was finding sheltered samples that ideally had not been exposed to the sun, uh, the atmosphere, to space for very long, which meant going to the bottoms of cliffs and underhangs and um, places where there were seemed to have been fresh landslides that exposed a surface behind. So that's a particular style of searching for where the good sample is going to be. Uh, that's a, a short introduction to some of the <laughs> what considerations. About, what about administrative questions about public versus private land? Oh, well, this is very important, right? Um, sampling is inherently destructive. You're taking pieces and bringing them back. Um, 
and it needs to be done with permission of the landowners or the public agencies and the indigenous people that have claims to um, ownership or stewardship of that land. And so depending where you go, there are both ethical and legal considerations. Mm -hmm. And it takes time to do your research as to what permits you need <coughs> and get the permits and beyond permitting to develop a sampling plan that is environmentally and culturally responsible. Mm -hmm. And field geology has not always been that good at this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we are trying to develop better practices now. It's an active conversation we are having in the division to get a set of policies in place and procedures so that when we think of a field project we want to do, one of the first things we think of is who do we need to ask to make sure that this is okay and what do we need to do to make sure that we're not causing harm to the landscape while doing the science that we want to do and how do we educate the tribe or the population or the federal agency or what have you about the fact that generally we're not there to exploit the landscape, we're not trying to make money off of it, we're trying to learn about it, which can be helpful for protecting it mm -hmm. as well as enhancing its scientific and cultural value by understanding how the landscape came to be there and explaining it. Um, And typically with um, government entities, there is a procedure. You file the permit, they evaluate the permit. If it satisfies the rules, they give you the permit. With private landowners and especially with indigenous people, it's much more about relationship building mm -hmm. and trust building. Um, and so, um, there was an incident a few years ago where a Caltech class was sampling um, on the volcanic tableland up north of Bishop without a permit on Bureau of Land Management land. Many excuses can be made that the BLM office was not responsive, their website was broken, they started the planning too late, anyway they went without a permit. and they were caught sampling without a permit and they were ordered to stop and um, then the Bureau of Land Management hired an archaeologist to come and survey the site and there were in fact petroglyphs not very far away um, and so a lawsuit was brought um, under the Archaeological Site Preservation Act, I don't remember the exact name of the law, it was settled, Caltech acknowledged um, that they were sampling without a permit and agreed to put a series of procedures in place so we wouldn't do it again and to publish an article to our um, addressed to the rest of the geological community saying here's how you do this right don't do what we did so just last weekend I wanted to bring my class up onto the volcanic table land near Bishop for something very short very simple and totally non-destructive that probably didn't require a permit at all, but I made sure to reach out to the Bureau of Land Management and say, I'm doing this, get a permit. And they actually sent an observer to watch me um, take these students out there for half an hour and just look at the rocks and then leave. So we are working on rebuilding our relationship with the Bureau of Land Management Bishop Office. In the case of um, sampling well, the Baffin Island expedition had two parts. The first part um, was in a national park, so we had to work with Parks Canada to make sure that they would permit what we were doing. The second part is not in the park, but um, it, Nunavut territory is um, a part of Canada that is very much administered and managed jointly by uh, the indigenous people and the Europeans and so we worked with the local indigenous group to make sure that um, they agreed to what we were doing 
that we were explaining ourselves to the indigenous people and that um, somehow what we were doing would benefit the indigenous people. Um, and this can be done at a casual level or it can be done deeply. Um, we hired uh, a man from the local um, people to come with us and be our bear spotter and see what we were doing and we learned from him and he learned from us. Um, so yes, this is a big subject and um, one that all of our field geologists are thinking about with increased intensity of late. Have you run into a native people's flat rejection of a request? I'm thinking, for example, like the attempt to build the TMT up on Mauna Kea. Mm -hmm. Are there analogs to that in geology for land being sacred, for there being like neo-colonial tensions, that kind of thing? I'm sure there are. I have not run into that um, for the small number of research expeditions that I have wanted to do. Um, in the places that I have wanted to go, no, I have not um, run into a no. No. The I'm, focus sure I'm sure it has happened sure. to many people, but not to me. The focus on faults in this project, did that give you any interface with the Seismolab? Um, was there overlap there in terms of what they were looking at? Which project? The field, the field work. Um, where you were explaining how, you know, what's coming into California from the sea, oh, what's oh, going oh. out. That one. Um, no, that fault is um, extinct. It moved tens of millions of years ago. And so seismologists um, wouldn't be able to observe it from active seismicity. They might be able to map where it is from seismic profiling, mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't really part of the project. I was just seeing it where it's exposed to the surface. So no, that project did not involve interacting with the Seismolab. Um, I have always been something of an outsider with respect to the Seismolab since I was not a geophysics con uh, major. And curiously, I run a lab now, the Shockwave Lab, which is in the sub-basement of South Mud. And Tom Ahrens, who built it, was a geophysics professor and a member of the Seismolab, yeah. but I am not. Um, so I've had several collaborations with Mike Gurness who is the director of the Seismolab, but not actually a seismologist. Right. Um, and a few collaborations with Don Helmberger and his students, or Rob, and Rob Clayton and his students, um, but I'm, I'm not a seismologist and have not um, worked hard to focus on projects that involve a lot of seismology. Mm -hmm. so. so amazingly, we're only still in year one of your <laughs> graduate <laughs> program. After all of this, how did you narrow your interests? How did Ed Stolper come to be your advisor? Mm -hmm. um, so I did these two projects, one kind of designing and conceiving this experiment that I would do, and the other one picking up rocks from um, Southern California and analyzing them. Um, it was still at that point clearly my intent to keep building this experiment and doing it. and. Um, Although Stevenson really conceived of the project and was the one that primarily was hoping to get a result, um, Stolper, with his experimental daring do, was much more involved day to day in how I would build this thing and how it would work. So um, he became my primary advisor. So after my exam, I really focused entirely for um, about three years on designing this apparatus, buying the parts that I would need, testing it in a stepwise manner, and building up towards the ultimate experiment. And so that was all going on. 
but then being in the Stolper group, what else was being talked about? What yeah. else was going on? Um, a lot of the, um, although he's primarily an experimentalist, um, at that time, late 80s, early 90s, um, experimental petrology reached a bit of a crisis. And the crisis was that we realized that you can't actually do an experiment that will completely explain the origin of a basaltic magma. That the process of making basaltic magmas is distributed over time and over temperature and over pressure and basaltic magmas are mixtures of increments of liquid that have equilibrated at different conditions. And each experiment only equilibrates at a single condition. So you need to do something beyond just the experiments if you're going to understand the problem. And in our reading group, I think it was a, um, a like a literature reading class led by Ed um, with a bunch of his students and students from the other um, petrology groups, we read a bunch of the attempts that were made at that time to build parameterizations, numerical models that took the results of many experiments and assembled them into um, a story. A story using more or less arbitrary functional forms, polynomials or planes or cubic splines or whatever. Um, and Ed is a very insightful scientist. He read all these papers with us and at the end of the term he said, these are all taking the wrong approach. This is a thermodynamic problem. We should calculate these equilibria from a good thermodynamic model with functional forms that are informed by thermodynamic reasoning and not simply selected because they appear to fit the data. And from that realization, Ed moved on to, okay, who's got such a model that um, could solve this problem? And the only one out there that we knew about was Mark Giorso's model. Um, Mark Giorso was, was at the time a professor at the University of Washington, and starting with his PhD thesis with Ian Carmichael at Berkeley, he developed a thermodynamic model that goes by the name of MELTS to describe equilibria among minerals and magmas. And so Ed said, let's hire one of Giorso's students to come here as a postdoc and solve this problem of if you use thermodynamic models to calculate distributed processes of mantle melting to make mixed magmas, what does this model have to say about this problem? So the student th of Giorso that was hired to come here and be a postdoc and do this problem was Mark Hirschman. And um, Mark and I started working together um, quite closely. He brought the code th that drives Giorso's model with him, and so it was by no means an open source model, but I got access to the code because it came here with Hirschman. And I started debugging it and um, finding problems with it and also trying to make it do what I wanted to make it do, which was different from anything that Giorso had conceived that it could do. And I didn't really have permission to do this. But by the time Mark Hirschman informed Mark Giorso that this graduate student was playing with his code, I had found and solved a whole bunch of significant problems with the code and demonstrated my usefulness. Before uh, you could get in trouble, you were going to get congratulated. Yeah, something like that. Um, so to hear Mark describe this period of activity from about 1994 to 1997, um, he failed to do what Ed had asked of him, which was in the course of one two-year postdoc write a paper that would say everything there was to say about this problem. It turned out to be much too fruitful and productive a thing to do to s finish in a couple of years and write one paper. So it took more like uh, 10 years and 10 papers. Um, and some of those papers were my thesis and some were Mark was the first author. Um, but this moment of insight that Ed had that 
this thermo this problem of going beyond single experiments and assembling them together to make a machine that could actually predict the output of complicated protracted processes over space and time and thermodynamic conditions that you should do this with thermodynamics and not just with arbitrary functions that was a really key insight and that mm -hmm. led to this whole body of work that um, supported Mark's career for many years and my career for many years. Paul, I want to go back to, if you could explain a little more the, the crisis that you explained. Was this sort of a, a, a gradual paradigm shift that things were more complex? Was there a landmark experiment that just really shifted people's perceptions? What, what, what started this? Yeah, um, I have to go back further than that. <laughs> um, starting in the 1960s, late 60s, um, the, um, there were two persistent schools of thought about the origin of mid-ocean ridge basalts, which are the most abundant igneous rock on Earth. They coat the entire floor of the ocean, right, which is 70% of the surface of the Earth. It's an important rock to understand, and it should be the simplest rock to understand because there is no pre-existing crust. When you pull the plates apart, you just have the mantle upwell and make fresh crust with nothing older to interact with, so it should be the simplest problem for us to understand. And uh, a school that um, followed more or less the pioneering ideas of Mike O'Hara, who was one of Ed Stolper's master's advisors, um, held that mid-ocean ridge basalts were um, derived by relatively high degree melting at relatively high pressure of relatively hot magmas that underwent extensive cooling and fractionation and crystallization in the crust before erupting the liquid that you see. There was another school of thought, more or less following on experimental work and ideas from Dean Presnell, who was a professor at University of Texas at Dallas, um, who held that mid-ocean ridges, mid-ocean ridge basalts formed at relatively low pressure and relatively low temperature by relatively low degrees of melting, and that what was erupting was almost what was coming right out of the mantle, with very little crystallization before erupting. And if you were thinking about this problem in terms of what we call batch melting, which is take your mantle source, equilibrate it at some pressure and temperature and melt fraction, and there's your liquid, um, there are two almost degenerate solutions where you can do that at um, 30,000 bars of pressure, or you can do that at 10,000 bars of pressure. You get two different liquids, but if you fractionate that one that was derived from 30,000 bars, it ends up coming to a final state that looks like very much like the one that you get from 10,000. And so this debate went on for about 20 years without any real clear winner because the solution is really um, not apparent. In the late 80s, um, two new ideas brought this debate to an end. One was thinking about how melts migrate, which comes back to that yeah. experiment I was trying to do. Mm -hmm papers by Dave Stevenson and by Dan McKenzie from Cambridge argued that at very low degree melting, the melts start to move relative to the solids. They can segregate and they can migrate. And therefore, they don't just sit there up to some final melt fraction reacting with their residue and staying in equilibrium with it. They leave. And that seems like it might be much more akin to a fractional melting process than a batch melting process. The experiments are all batch melting. And if you can't m experimentally do a fractional melting process, then maybe you can't actually um, describe what's really going on. So the physical reasoning about the, mi mo the migration of melts and the rates at which they melt and whether they stay in equilibrium with their sources, that was one piece of information that came to light. The other was the um, advent of the ion microprobe or secondary ion mass spectrometer, which is an analytical instrument that lets you analyze trace element concentrations at micro scale. And 
um, groups out of um, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution led by Henry Dick and uh, Nobu Shimizu, who was the ion probe wizard, um, looking at abyssal peridotites, which are a category of rock that you can find on the seafloor that are thought to be the residues left over after extraction of the oceanic crust. When you look at the abyssal peridotites, they do not look like residues of batch melting. They, the trace elements are too strongly fractionated from one another. They look like the residues of fractional melting from which melts are being progressively extracted and not allowed to react with the residue. So we have the physical reasoning from thinking about melt migration and the chemical evidence from the abyssal peridotites, which ought to be complementary to the basalts, which is what everybody had been looking at before. And together, these brought an end to the, is it this kind of batch melting or is it this kind of batch melting debate because it isn't either of those things. Mm -hmm. And everybody realized you had to put together some story that could describe what happens in a situation where the melts are migrating, separating from their residue and being mixed before um, fractionating and erupting. And this was Ed's thermodynamic insight? Well, no, that came later, right? The insight that you had to do something uh -huh. Um, led to a, a string of papers um, with various attempts to do this. So the, some of the earliest ones were by um, Charlie Langmuir, who was then at Lamont, and his student Emily Klein. There was another independent attempt to do this by Dan McKenzie and a petrologist from Cambridge named Mike Bickle. Um, there was a student at um, University of Hawaii at Manoa named Yao Ling Nu, working with a petrologist there named Rodi Batiza. Um, there was the um, MIT group led by Tim Grove and his student Ro Kinsler. So all four of these groups wrote independent papers that attempted to do this problem of um, calculating what you would get from a melting environment where the melts were separating from the residue and then being mixed. Those were the papers that we read in that reading group um, in the early 90s and um, tried to decide whether any one of them was best or whether they were all taking the wrong approach. So um, the thermodynamic approach, which it seemed to us was the right way to do the problem, in principle that is true, in practice it's difficult. Um, the thermodynamics is right in principle, but it's always wrong in practice because the um, predictions that you make depend on the data that you have available to estimate um, quantities like standard enthalpies of formation of compounds and heat capacities and volumes and mixing properties. Um, even though it is true in theory that if you know the Gibbs energy, of all the possible minerals and melts, the equilibrium will be the state of minimum Gibbs energy. It's a big if, because knowing the Gibbs energy depends on all this empirical data, and the empirical data are incomplete and noisy. And so you can build a good thermodynamic model, you can build a bad one. Just because you're using thermodynamics doesn't mean you're going to get the right answer. And knowing whether the answer is right is also challenging, because you're trying to use it to make predictions specifically where you don't have experimental constraints. So um, the thermodynamic models that we built, starting from Giorso's architecture, um, made predictions. And some of those predictions could be tested against data. And some of them could not. And they were clearly offsets. But even when things were offset from the right answer, because they were internally consistent, um, you could look at trends um, that might be parallel to the real function, even if it wasn't the real function. Anyway, because thermodynamic models can be wrong, and they're very complicated, and difficult to assess completely, this is another key thing that I learned from Ed, is try to do both a simple version of the model, where you can understand what the model is doing completely, 
and the complex version that is more like the natural situation and look for what those models have in common. And that's what should be robust and you can actually believe. Mm. Um, so my first paper arising out of this kind of work, um, which is a um, published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society because the Royal Society held like a discussion meeting and Ed went and presented this work and so it got published in Philosophical Transactions. Um, looks at, from a thermodynamic perspective, what happens as you're decompressing a parcel of mantle rock and it starts melting and it encounters a mineral-mineral phase transition. So as a function of pressure, the mantle contains different minerals. As you're going up in pressure, you favor denser minerals, which usually means rearranging the atoms, um, the oxygen atoms around the aluminum first, eventually in much deeper in the mantle, rearranging the oxygen atoms around the silicon. But in the upper mantle, if you're going down, um, the stable assemblage in for the first um, 10 kilometers, no, for the first 30 kilometers is plagioclase lertzolite, it's the name of the rock, plagioclase, two pyroxenes and olivine in it. Then there's a wide range from about um, 30 kilometers depth to about 80 kilometers depth where you have spinel lertzolite, so the plagioclase reacts out and you make the mineral spinel. And then from 70 kilometers or so down from there you have garnet lertzolite where the spinel reacts out and it makes garnet. So on the way up, if you have an ascending, ascending parcel of garnet lertzolite and it starts melting, what happens when it changes to spinel lertzolite? And if your spinel lertzolite keeps ascending, what happens when, if it changes to plagioclase lertzolite? So if you look at the phase diagrams, the stability of these minerals and liquids as a function of pressure and temperature, there is what we call a cusp on the solidus. The solidus is the curve where melting begins. It's generally concave down, but it has a cusp where it kinks back up at the intersection with the spinel plagioclase transition and at an intersection with the garnet spinel transition. And because there's a low point at the cusp, Dean Presnell, who was one of the participants in this lengthy debate about the origin of mid-ocean ridge basalts, argued that that cusp is the most likely place for most of the melt production to happen. It's kind of sticking down to a cold point on the solidus, and so if the mantle is heating up, that's where the pressure temperature profile is likely to intersect the melting point. And when I started running the thermodynamic models across this phase transition, I got a very unexpected behavior. You didn't get a bunch of melt at that point. It froze at that point and it stopped melting. Exactly the opposite of what Pres Presnell had told us would happen there. And I showed this to Ed and Ed said, that's wrong, go do it again. And I did it again and I got the same answer. And then we went to the Starbucks over there at um, Lake in California and talked for a while. And on the back of a napkin, um, Ed sketched a simple, a simplified model, the simplest model that we could think of that would have this behavior. And in that model, it was clear to us, well, it was clear to Ed because he had been trained by James B. Thompson <laughs> how to think about this problem, that the decompression of a parcel of mantle, a large parcel of mantle moving at centimeters per year, um, the independent variable that governs the energy budget of the system is not temperature. The independent variable is entropy. It is an adiabatic reversible process that happens at constant entropy and the temperature is just an output. And when you think of it that way and you realize that it takes entropy to drive the solid-solid phase transition and therefore the entropy is not available to drive melting, you get the insight that actually what should happen at these cusps on the solidus is not melting but freezing exactly what the complex thermodynamic model was doing. And then we felt we understood it. We knew why the model was doing that. And so we wrote a paper that showed in a one component system, which is the chemically simplest system you can write down, where you can draw complete phase diagrams on two dimensional pieces of paper that show everything. It is obvious in the one component system that if you have a phase transition like this, it has to cause freezing. And then we did the two-component system, which is chemically a little bit more complicated, but has behaviors that the mantle has because it's a solid solution. We can show that this, that system will also freeze when it encounters one of these reactions. 
and then we showed the full melts calculations from the Giorso thermodynamic model that at this point I had modified to the point where it could do this constant entropy calculation. It was the only model that could do the constant entropy calculation. All the other models were formulated in terms of temperature that that would also cause freezing at these phase transitions. And so we published this paper. And the best ideas are ideas where people who understand the state of the field can read the paper and say, of course, why didn't I think of that? Right? So they would, nobody ever said to me, this paper's wrong. Because we explained it clearly enough that we had found the essence of why it had to be right. Um, and at my first American Geophysical Union meeting, um, I was introduced to Dean Presnell when I had just published this paper saying his whole way of thinking about this problem was wrong. Um, <laughs> this could go one of two ways. <laughs> well, I was introduced to him by another petrologist um, from UMass Amherst named uh, Tony Morse, who was quite a character. And Tony s pulled over Dean Presnell and said, Dean, you know, this is Paul Asimo. This is, this is Ed Stolper's student who caught you with your pants down. <laughs> 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 um, so actually, yeah, I had an ongoing debate with with Presnell for several years. Um, so it wasn't settled as far as he was as concerned? As far as he was concerned, it was not settled. Um, that while my one component system and my two component system and the full multi component melts model may have shown this one behavior, he was convinced that his five component system, which is where he did his experiments, um, still showed the opposite behavior. And so that the sort of induction we were doing from one to two to ten components, skipping over five, that he didn't accept that that was um, that, that there weren't uh, gremlins lurking in between. Has enough time passed where a, a, a verdict is in that's uh, universally accepted? Um, I don't know. I haven't talked to people about this issue in a long time. I've moved on to do other things. Yeah. Um, Melts makes some real errors, some of which we fixed a few years later with a recalibration called P-melts. It has the same behavior in this respect as melts, so it's not quite as exaggerated. Um, the, um, I would say there's not that been that much attention focused on the spinel plagioclase transition because it's in fact it's only really relevant in very cold parts of the mantle and not much of the mantle is that cold. Um, that most attention these days has focused on the somewhat higher pressure range where spinel peridotite is dominant anyway and so arguing a whole bunch over whether the spinel plagioclase transition causes melting or freezing not that many people are arguing about it because the spinel plagioclase transition probably doesn't really happen because too much melting has taken place by the time you get there. I would say is the uh, the short version of where that argument went. Um, before we run out of time, I want to tell one more story about sort of mm, as a student in this group encountering senior scientists um, and um, their interactions with each other. Mm -hmm. So we had then and we continue to have a weekly reading group. It's now called Petrology Reading Group. At the time I think it was called SOS, Students of Stolper, <laughs> um, where we pick often a fairly recent paper that's been published in the general field of petrology. We all read it, we get together, and we talk about it. And one of the papers that we read when I was a student, this is like maybe 1994, um, we had a visiting scientist that year, also, I don't know if it was the Fairchild Scholar or the Moore Scholar Program at that point, one of these senior visiting scientists, uh, named Albrecht Hoffmann. Um, who is was the director of the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry in Mainz and a really important and influential geochemist, really the most influential German geochemist. Um, 
we read a paper, and Al, and Al was here um, for that reading, by Claude Alleg, the most influential French geochemist, um, which attempted to use principal component analysis to interpret the <coughs> geochemistry of oceanic basalts, and came up with a result that was really bizarre. But in principal component space, it seemed to be right. And I didn't believe it. Um, and I went home and I got the original data before they got transformed by principal component transformation, which is a way of extracting the information from a complex multi-dimensional data set. And I saw why the data had been handled inappropriately and what was wrong with the treatment. And looking at the data, the original data, it was obvious. And I came back the next week and I presented this to the group. I said, this is why this paper is total nonsense. So Al, at the end of his visit to Caltech, went back to Europe and he went and he told Claude Alleg, Stolper has a student who says you're an idiot. <laughs> All of these introductions <laughs> you have to deal with. And then Al invited me, and actually also John Eiler, who was then a postdoc mm -hmm. here, to a meeting that the Max Planck Institute convened at their castle in Bavaria. Um, this castle called Schloss Ringburg that was built by one of the Mad Dukes of Bavaria and then given to the city of Munich, which didn't know what to do with it, so they gave it to the Max Planck Institute, which turned it into a conference center. Um, this was the second Plume Conference. The first Plume Conference was here. It was convened by um, Don Anderson, who was advocating this um, unpopular position that mantle plumes underneath hotspots don't exist. You've got to get together a bunch of people to talk about plumes. And a few years later, they had a second conference. And at this um, Plume II conference, I had the opportunity to sit down with Claude Oleg and explain what was wrong with this paper he wrote. And he was very stubborn, and it was a very long conversation. But after 90 minutes or so, he agreed that I had a point mm. and said he would publish a retraction, which he never did. <laughs> <laughs> it was a moral victory for you, at least. Yeah. Um, but um, from the ability to see what was wrong with this paper and pick it apart, I impressed Al Hoffman. And I'm guessing that um, years later, when people had to write letters for me to be hired or to be promoted mm -hmm. that probably Al was one of those letter writers. I uh -huh. don't know that for a fact. I'm just inferring um, that. Um, somebody, you know, in principle the whole hiring and tenure process and who's writing letters and what the letters say ought to be very confidential. But somebody once let slip something like you have a few really big fans out there. Oh, wow. So no, I was always trying to figure out who those fans were. Um, so I think Al Hoffman was probably one of them, uh, is probably one of them. Well, Paul, on that note, we'll pick up next time mm -hmm. from this one paper how you broaden this out into your thesis. Maybe we could just end editorially. I can harken back to what you said in our last session where <coughs> coming to Caltech, you knew that you would be treated like a colleague, not a student. And the story you told about working through this problem with Ed really and truly illustrates that this is these are two not not co-equals obviously but you're working side by side this is not a student professor kind of relationship this is a two scientists working through a problem obviously to great effect yes exactly we'll pick up for next time <laughs>